Welcome to Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert, a podcast sponsored by the Healing Lives Center. Discover how to love and lead your family well and biblically. God created sex, marriage, and the family for our stewardship, growth, and benefit. My heart and passion is to teach, train, educate, and disciple Christians that want strong marriages and families. The Healing Lives Center has been serving Christians since the year 2000. Its mission is to be a center for sex, trauma, and marriage education and transformation, where we offer counseling, coaching, courses, and speaking services to you, your church, or ministry. Check us out at HealingLives.com. Moms and dads, this is for you. This is a recording of a session I did at the Homeschool Conference in June 2022 in Albany, Oregon, the Ocean Homeschool Conference, and this is session three, Age Appropriate Conversations. All right, welcome, welcome. So this session, uh, a little different than what we've done before today, um, the age of conversation, we're going to really literally focus on birth to five, six to ten, kind of what do we talk about, how, and some of those kind of things. So hopefully a very practical application. The QR code here is to access the handouts that will be later if they're not on there right now, and then the, um, record, the video recording as well and some other stuff as I continue to do that. So... Uh, welcome, welcome. Now let me start with a story. These are my two boys a few years ago, Alex and Blaze. Um, most of us, when we, when we go somewhere, we tend to have an expectation about what's going to happen at a location. So I love to go skiing. This is Hoodoo, one of our favorite places to go. It's the last day of the season. Um, people were doing some crazy stuff. There's a people up top jumping off with uh, hang gliders and doing some crazy stuff. People wearing um, interesting clothes and outfits. Well, there was a number of girls wearing um, sports bras, and my son was like, "They're not supposed to be wearing those." It's like, wear whatever they want. It's none of your business. It's a little kid. Um, and so then he went up to one of the guys and said, "Why is she wearing that?" Because he's got no filter. <laughs> and he said, "Because she's hot." He's like, "So which one is it?" <laughs> Hot temperature or anyway. So we went on the day or continued through the day, and then all of a sudden, down comes a girl who's topless. And I'm like, oh great, this is gonna be fun. Luckily Blaze was nowhere to be found. He did not see this because he would have just had a heyday with that one. Instead it was Alex. So I chase after Alex and I get to the bottom of the slope and there's Alex just wide-eyed. Because this was not a small young small young lady, old lady, it was not a young lady. Um, she was quite large, and she had flown right past him. So then I passed her, got to him, and it's like, so, first time? <laughs> He's like, yes. <laughs> I was like, how'd you like it? I'm not going to say that. I didn't answer that. He's just totally embarrassed. It's a horrible moment. He's just shocked. It's not what you expect. And if you think of what we do as parents, everything we're trying to do is trying to protect them from certain things. Did not expect to go skiing that day and have to have these conversations. And what we're going to see today is actually most everything that's going to happen is going to be almost happen outside of our purview or our ability to control, which is why we must be earlier rather than late. A lot of times, I, what I'm seeing is most often we're erring on the side of too late. Even to this point, to the point of that our children will believe almost whatever they hear first. It's just scary to think about. So a number of years ago, actually I think it was two years ago, California mandated that all kindergartens have to teach all 15 genders. I'm not sure where they got 15 from, because Facebook has 75 to 90 something, <laughs> and they're in California, so they haven't talked. I don't know if they haven't caught up yet. But parents are freaking out, because if you live there, you kind of have to have six jobs to live. So you can't have a stay-at-home mom very easily, um, or dad, so what do you do? And then here's what I hear from parents. Well, my child's too young for me to teach them, but I'm going to send them to school, and they are. So they're not too young for them, them, whoever them is, but they are too young. For, no, we need to reverse that. We need to be the ones. If they're walking into that school or in that any situation, we have prepared them um, for what's, what's next. Our experience influences our parenting. All of our experiences do. Everything that we've been through. For some of us, the reason why we actually homeschool is we homeschool because of something that's happened to us. Things that actually harmed us. 
And if we don't deal with those things, we actually tend to pass that on in other ways of either overprotection um, or other um, setups that actually hurt that child as well. So we're literally today going to talk through uh, what does God say about you and then what does God say about others and the boundaries, kind of looking at you and others in terms of these age-appropriate conversations. Now, um, I know some of you may not like movies, may not like, um, you know, enjoy, I love movies, I love going to the movies, I love TV shows, and you can't watch one nowadays without something, it's really frustrating. Something either inappropriate or something just downright wrong in almost everything. You, and you have to make a decision as a family, so what do I do with that? How do I navigate that? I can either avoid it all, all completely, or there's lots of conversations that have to be had. First time that we were watching The Voice. I love that TV show. And these two kids get up to sing together. And it was a guy and a girl, except they were twin girls. And one had transitioned. And my son's like, what? And we pause and we have a conversation. Well, a number of years ago, um, I took my kids to see this movie. Ready Player One. Great movie. Really interesting movie. Um, I have a, I think it was like a 10-year-old, a 8-year-old, and a 6-year-old. Something around that age range. Two boys and a girl, my, my kids. And we're watching this movie set in the future, and basically people escape the crazy world they live in through VR, so not too far away now, <laughs> with our num- num- lovely Oculus. But there's this one scene that came in, came on in there that I'm just like uncomfortable. It wasn't bad, but I'm uncomfortable as a dad sitting next to my two sons and my daughter. So after this was over, we get home, I asked them, so separately, Tell me about, about what you liked about this movie. And so this was the, the scene here. It's when she was, they're in their VR personas, and she's dressed in this really tight form um, dress, really pretty. Well, my oldest son, he was just uncomfortable, kind of like me. He was very aware that, hmm, and this is not, I'm not sure what to do with this. No place to kind of put this in my head. Um, my other son... There's a, the VR suits that they wear actually do pressure points on the body. So if you get hit somewhere, you feel it in your body. So he just loved the scene where the guy got kicked in the crotch and he got hurt through VR. And he just like, oh, it's so funny. He just that was his, that's all he could think about. But my daughter was like, oh, what a beautiful dress. And she just thought that was such a pretty dress. And to see all three of our kids are going to face these questions and these things at different ages. When we talk as a family about these topics, we actually, we have a, tend to have a room full of different age groups. You can't, you could, I guess, if you have all all sorts of time, segregate out, we're gonna talk to this age group here, and this age group, then you have to keep notes, by the way, pay records, pay like a committee to know which kid have you talked to what about. No, we don't do that. What we do is we actually have conversations, and the older kids tend to be the focus, and the younger ones are kind of there. Kind of like even for today. When they're younger and they don't understand what's going on, they tend to just not understand what's going on. Like, I really, we err on the other side. We err on the side of protecting them from versus preparing. Because when they're ready, they'll finally have a file folder to stick that information in. It's like it just kind of sits there waiting and they're not ready. When I deal with kids who've been, who've been sexually abused, and I'm talking to the parents usually at this point, it's preparing them for when their brain finally catches up to what actually happened to them physically. And when they finally come to an awareness, it's like, oh, that's what that was. Oh. And then there's a two, two pathways. One of just going downhill, introversion, or acting out like crazy. And it's like, it'd be nice to find either one of those and find a third alternative to what's going to potentially happen. And so when we have these kinds of things, you and I all, we're all trying to navigate and decide what's the right thing I should do and what's, what's the wrong thing. There are, you can talk to our kids, you can talk to Kelly and I. So many examples where I can tell you I probably would do that different. <laughs> we could all probably commiserate on the things we would say I would do different. But one thing I would say is critical is for you and I to see that a key responsibility is sex ed for our kids. And it's way more than just sex ed. It's the whole idea of who you are, how you were made, how God made you. The stuff we've talked about earlier today. What does this include? And this is what I, why I wrote this I Can't Say That book. 
is really focusing on this is our responsibility. We need to learn about basic human sexuality, just how do things work. And most of us never learn this stuff. I never did. And I got into this as I saw client after client not knowing what to do. And so I just kept studying and studying and studying and learning. Same for trauma. I don't have a history of trauma. I became a passion because of so many clients with so much pain. And I'm going, I've got to learn to help. And digging in. And you each have your different areas of gifting and interest. But how can we come together as well and, and raise great children that actually key in the as an adult, love the Lord in terms of who they are. We need to become a confident parent, but how do we do that? It's through knowledge. It's learning. We need to learn. So this, the I Can't Say That book is actually about that. How do I as a parent know what I believe, and then how do I then teach that at an age-appropriate um, level? We need to know a theology of sex, brain and sex, brain and love, theology of marriage. One of my favorite chapters in the book, my wife wanted me to delete, um, she was my editor, <laughs> is the one on the brain on sex and the brain on love. It's all these neuro, the neuroscience stuff, all the neurotransmitters and the hormones, and it's like all nerdy. Um, and what does it show? It shows a beautiful design by an be incredible creator. That's what I love about that. Why we do what we do is for a reason, and because of a design, that when we understand it, it's like, oh, well, that makes sense why uh, we do that. Example... Um, we tend to say men are pigs when it comes to dating or to affairs, like acting out. Well, yeah, more men in the past, long time in the past, would have affairs and less women, except who they were they having it with. Another whole subject. Um, until the Industrial Revolution happened. And as the woman left the farmhouse and she started going out to the workforce, the adultery rate for the wives increased as well. The truth is, is we're all a mess. And we need to be careful with some of these stereotypes we even use. Um, I have clients who had, he's had the affairs, I have clients where she has. Like it's an equal opportunity employer here. We need to understand how we're made and then a belief system. And that's a really important thing. Now, for you and I, and the point of this is either I do or someone else does. You've got to make that decision. What I am seeing in my practice is the decision has been made, I'm going to let the school, I'm going to let the internet, I'm going to let porn, I'm going to let friends, I'm going to let everyone else go there because my kid's not a teenager yet. Like, actually, when your kid turns 11 or 12, you're pretty much done parenting, if you didn't know that, in the way that you think of parenting. If you don't pivot at that 11 or 12 age, you're now fighting against uh, basically a current sometimes. If you don't change the way you approach them, because you're releasing them little by little, and they know it all, if you didn't know that, they know it all. So you have to prepare them for that stage, and so when you prepare them, it's in the single digits. It's gonna be when they're younger. So let's look through these, these ages. So what does God say about you? And again, we're gonna put this into two categories, you and others um, here. So birth to five, we're gonna kinda use that as the first category. These are two of our kiddos. We like to cover them in mud. In the beginning, what do we talk to our kids about? They need to understand basic anatomy. Basic anatomy. And here's the piece with that basic anatomy. Correct body part vocabulary. Why is this important? It's more important for later. When there's trauma and the vocabulary has been taught, it's much easier caught. It's much easier understood. When there's not the vocabulary there, so much more gets actually missed as an adult because we don't understand what they're saying. My daughter one time was saying, my bottom hurts, my bottom hurts, my bottom hurts, holding her front. She didn't have a word for it. And then my wife goes, well, I didn't know what to call it. And it's a vulva. We say vagina, but that's the inside. We need to know what to call it. And we get embarrassed by these words. And it's like, no, we need to teach them in one and two. This is how you're made. This is a beautiful part of how you're made. And then there are boundaries around that. And this is an interesting one. Be sure not to stereotype what is boy or girl, but emphasize they are a boy or girl. A lot of our young people are growing up going, there's something broken with me because I'm not doing what other boys do or other girls do. Or because I like this, there's something wrong with me. And because our culture is so good at saying, then therefore you must be something you're not. 
because there's no one, no man is trans transitioned to woman and no woman is transitioned to man. It's impossible. Um, we don't, we aren't. We are a male or female by birth that can have very different ways to express who we are and how we live that out. And that they are loved by God and their family. These are the key kind of foundations about them that we actually start with. Not when they're six, seven, eight. This is the beginning. Now, in that birth to five, what are some other key parts of this? About others. Recognizing that others and their bodies are different. You're going to start helping them notice that. You're going to use TV shows or movies. You're going to use friends. You're going to use each other. But how, how to recognize that there's a difference there. And then begin teaching of appropriate touch towards and from others. This is when the seeds are planted of this. Un before age five. Why at age seven, by age seven, their full identity is in place. Their full personality is in place. Which is crazy to think about. By age seven. This is marked, this season is marked by curiosity and exploration. Curiosity and exploration. This is what this is about. They're not broken when they're curious and exploring. Yet I feel like what we do is we tend to think that in our actions, trying to correct them when it's like, no, they're being two, they're being four, they're being five. So understanding what's even normal and appropriate. So this is just the beginning. This is the one I feel like we miss a lot, but the next one's where I feel like we miss the most. So this is that window where you're building a foundation as a mom and dad, as a leader, as a parent, for what needs to happen in six to 10. This is probably the most important category or space or time frame in, in your child's development. So what happens here? More descriptive anatomy. You're upping the game about what kind of the way we talk about bodies, understand the body. Um, we had a conversation recently where we were talking about, um, was it um, circumcision? Circumcision, that's what it was, circumcision. And so it was actually fun. Pull out the anatomy book. You go, here's what it is. You know, we didn't disrobe. We didn't do anything inappropriate. We used resources we have and talked through what is it, why, and then talk about, hey, there's a debate about it, and that, on and on and on. You're planting seeds. Some of you could probably give more data than others about what you've researched or learned about some of these things, uh, depending on your you know, field of expertise or passions or interests. This is a season where we're actually really going to be talking about sexual identity. And let's notice we aren't even in adolescence yet. We are not in adolescence yet. We are talking here about a foundation. We hear from young people all the time, I've always felt different since I was single digits. That's a very normal part of see people's story. It's okay, so we need to go back there and talk about, so what is it that came out there and what we're really seeing is a lot of our struggle in sexual identity, and Jordan Peterson recently really said it well, he said, it's personality. We need to stop calling it what they're calling it or what the culture's calling it, it's personality. I am, I love, I crochet, I cross stitch, I love music, I have a bachelor's in music, I'm very much that artsy kind of world, and in the end I'm still the guy, I'm still the guy. Just like a woman who loves to hunt and loves to fish and loves to mud and love all, that, all that kind of stuff isn't because she likes that. Maybe she's in the wrong body. We need to be really careful because our culture is pushing something that is downright harmful. So how do we engage in that? We have to catch this earlier. We need to go into this other really, really hard conversation at this age, the N word. We need to talk about masturbation. And how we actually talk about it really is important. If it's, this is bad, this is sinful, you're going to hell, I promise you your kid will suffer, suffer in silence and they will not talk to you versus it being a conversation. I actually ask my sons about what their masturbation practices every few weeks or so. Do they answer me? No. They did when they were younger. But what do they tell? What do I do? By asking the question, it actually moves it out of their unconscious to their conscious, and they have to decide, do I take my thoughts captive? Do I steward this, or I just do something passively as a habit? 
It gives them a chance to steward something that really just tends to fly under the radar by asking these questions. You need a theology of this. That's part of what I have in my book, is, is in both of them, is this, how do I talk through this really, I would say, controversially tense topic? When I started teaching in Georgia, I had um, the, the counselor was on stage doing Q&A with students. I'm like second year teacher, and the question of masturbation came up, and the, the counselor actually said this from stage in front of thousands of students. Oh, Ask Dr. Gilbert about that. He's an expert at that. <laughs> so I had a lot of students going to back heard which you're an expert in. Thanks. That's really embarrassing. And I'm in my, what, I think I was 30, yeah, actually 30, 31. So it's like, wow, this is really not good. <laughs> we need to know how to talk through this. And one of the kind of a simple summary of the way I talk through this is we need to stop just say, hey, this is sin, slap your hand and move on. We need to help you steward what's happening in your head, heart, and the fantasy. And when I engage in this practice, am I actually getting closer to who I'm fantasizing about and getting further away? And when I start consciously thinking about this, I'm getting further away. And now I have a choice. Do I want to get closer to this person or further away? And now I actually have the choice, and I tend to hear from most of the guys and girls I talk to, I actually don't want to do it as much anymore. Like I actually am stewarding now. I have choice now. Where it felt like it was some beast within that could, I couldn't control. That's because it was in the unconscious and I just had habit. And a lot of what's happening for us is just habit. Same for even pornography. And this is a stage of talking about dignity and modesty. You, each of your families, are going to outline what does that mean for your son or your daughter. And how you dress and how you present yourself. Uh, my daughter got a you know, a whole bunch of hand-me-down clothes at one point, and my wife pulls out this sports bra, and she's like, so, is this going to be what? What's the rule or a home, an underclothes only, or she can wear this around the house, which is fine when they're little, but you're also planting seeds as they grow up. And so my comment was, that's underclothes, and it becomes, we set the tone, so do you. I feel like we don't tend to do it thoughtfully. We just kind of let it happen. But this is that stage prior to the fight, later on, about whether something is inappropriate or not, you're, you're planting seeds as to what our home expects, if you will. And then it's a dialogue. As they get older, especially past this age, um, this is a time of negotiating and back and forth as they have their own personality and opinion and you're wanting to relate to them. You have the veto card, you're the parent, but um, how do I draw them to their own um, not to, to believe what you believe exactly, but to think through what they're doing. Pornography. The average age that a kid sees porn is in the single digits. We don't wait till they're 10, 11, 12 to start talking about this. Now, many of our families, maybe that's not the case because of the way we've set up media at home or access to stuff. Great. It's going to happen at some, some place. And actually, most of the time, it's somewhere outside the the tight reined web of control that you've created as a parent. It's sitting in the hallway at youth group, at church, or at the pastor's house, or somewhere where you never would have guessed that somebody pulls out a device and starts looking at something. And you need to have helped them think through that when that happens, their immediate response is, hey, we don't do that. Well, it's not curiosity, it's not it tends to be curiosity paired with disgust in the first time for many boys and girls, but then curiosity tends to trump it. Help them see that, no, we don't treat people that way. We have a boundary. Why You've already prepped them, talking through, this is something that is a misuse of people. Now, one of the places we're going in our culture with this is, I don't know if you've heard of ethically sourced pornography. <laughs> So, welcome to, I guess it's like free-range chickens? I don't know. <laughs> so it's not people who've been trafficked or abused or... But this is scary. We're trying to normalize what even secular culture is saying. You know what? This is a health hazard. This is a bad thing for our, our world. Even secular researchers are saying this is a bad idea. As it just keeps getting pushed more and more and more and more. It's just normalized even. And among our kids... In the circle of friends that they have, not ours, all of our kids, some of those kids, because of where they 
have or haven't had these conversations, it's very much either normal if not pushed. And so that's something we have to be preparing them for, to think through, to steward, even though we would really wish to say they're not old enough. They're not. You're not. We shouldn't have to deal with this. But it's the world we live in, so we need to prep them. Another one is periods and wet dreams prep. It blows my mind the amount of women I've talked to who they thought they were dying. No young lady should come to that age and think they're dying. They should have conversations to know what's coming next. How? My wife's in the bathroom on her period. And my daughter's going, what is she doing? And my son's standing right there. And it's, well, she's having a period. And that's explaining what is, what happens and why. And God's design. And they go, ew, they go gross. They have the reactions. But it becomes something that's just a normal part, not an assault on myself. Or as I've heard from so many, I literally found myself somewhere thinking I'm dying. That's not okay. Wet dreams. The young, young men, you need to know what this is. And have it's been explained and talked through it and no, help them normalize that so they're prepared for what's going to happen. And they're also not messed up um, with that. Gender. You are a boy or a girl. Doesn't matter how many, if you undo your onesie. Doesn't mean if you undo your onesie. It doesn't matter if you, you know, want to dress a certain way. Or it doesn't matter what you want to do. I love putting on my grandmother's house the high heels and all the stuff with my million female cousins that did probably whatever they did to dress me up as a little kid. That doesn't mean you're not a boy or a girl. It means you're playing a game. So be careful. But yet, what I see is these families who have changed the decor of their home and their kids' bedroom, bought new clothes, bought toys, and it's like, that kid didn't have a job. Mom and Dad did that. And they catered to something that's a lie, and now we got even a bigger problem than we had before. So be really careful to, to guide and lead them, even though it sounds and feels unloving, uh, we need to talk to each of our sons and daughters and how you are fearfully and wonderfully made and how you live that out. It's going to be different than maybe someone else because we're constantly comparison, comparing. We begin this stage talking about sexual reproduction as well. How? Lay it out there. There's actually a box set. and I, I'll have a link on my blog. It's, my blog got messed up, so I had to redo it. But there's a box set of what we have, the books we had on our shelf. Of age appropriate, kind of a little picture book. It's a great set where the kids would just pull it off the shelf and start talking about it. Really, really good. Cool. And sometimes we would go find the book and pull it um, pull it off the shelf and talk to our kids. Remember the first time Alex came up, asked a question, we pulled the book out. Or actually, Kelly said, Corey, help. And we pulled the book out, read it, and he's like, oh, okay, off to playing Legos. But then the next time he asked the same question, and he's like, oh. Like, it's like it finally landed. You're, you're wanting to be ahead of that curve, not behind that curve, where he's maybe asking questions where he shouldn't, or Google, or Alexa, or somewhere else. Um, and the important thing about this stage is personality is set in stone at age seven. Who they are. And here's the even creepier thing. What is going to change that personality after the age of seven? Trauma. Trauma. Careful what you pray for. And actually, sometimes that is what we need to pray for. We need to pray for our son or daughter to be broken to get it. So I'd rather them break here to come to Christ than to live a life apart from Him. So it's like we need to be careful what we pray for, but be intentional. By, by seven years old, some parents are still trying to find sleep. Like, it's an elusive thing. And they're trying to... to it's just survival, which is why we need one another. We need you know, our churches. We need family, we need relationships. We're not supposed to do this alone. Now, the same stage, what about others? We need to be planting the seeds at this stage, what this whole boyfriend-girlfriend thing is. What are the, your rules? What is your parameters for this? When our kids were that young, our conversation was, you can start dating when you're a junior or senior in college. And at that age, you're like, whatever, I don't know what that even means. And then our oldest gets 12, 13, and starts liking girls, and it's like, okay, passport purity, what did that? Actually, at nine, we did that with him. And we have these conversations, and then 
he starts being interested in girls, and so how do you handle that? Well, he knows it's not a rule that you can't. It's careful of expecting you have to. And then when you do start actually being serious with someone, and we're all probably going to differ on what that age should be, what's next? What are the boundaries? Can you only do only spend time at someone's house? You know, can you go out by yourself? What when they turn 16 and they can drive? What is it? You're planting these seeds not at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You're doing it in the single digits. So that when you get here, you're having less of a battle. Because we are having, for many of us, our adolescent years are a battle of the will. Or because I'm the parent card, <laughs> which we need to be careful of. So at this point, you need to be planting the seeds of what is our family's expectations of boyfriend, girlfriend? That that's a note, that here are the boundaries, or this needs to be done. Um, I, if you have a daughter, I'm already ready to have my IAR torn, torn apart on the table and tell the young man, all right, put it back together. You see how that goes over. <laughs> She's 11, so not there yet. Another one is we actually need to talk about the masturbation piece, but from the others, what about other people? So it's not just a personal thing. We need to externalize this. That when you do this yourself, how does this impact, as I kind of mentioned earlier, other people in relationships? And so this comes up here on the others because it's a boundary, too, that I need to see that my choice actually impacts how I relate to other people. I say I want to get closer to him or her, but yet what I'm doing is actually making me go further and further away in my heart. So when I'm aware of that, I'm more in control, if you will. Trauma and abuse, another really, really important area. We talked about in the beginning, an earlier age, that we actually need to prep in terms of vocabulary. It's for this. Every time my kids stayed with a babysitter, when they left, and I would tell my, these were students in Georgia, uh, they were students of mine, and so they knew, because I, I would say this in class, that when they left, I would ask my sons and daughter about, did anyone touch you? Did anyone change your diaper? Did anyone... Like, at these earlier ages, I wasn't looking for them to tell me the truth. I knew that was far-fetched. I was looking for them to change the way they were answering me. Because then I know something happened. One day I came home, we came home, and our um, lovely, amazing uh, babysitter was like freaked out. She's like, your son, I deleted it already, but your son took my phone and took a picture of his penis. What in the world? So sometimes your kids would just be nuts. No pun intended on that word. Anyway, um, she deleted the picture, supposedly. Um, that's going to happen. You want to prep, even like when my babysitters are college students, they knew that I was going to do that. It wasn't something covert, kind of like the teddy bear cam. <laughs> it wasn't that. It was they know. And we have cameras around our house, mainly aimed at screens. So I can pull my phone out and check and see what's on any screen in our house. And that's what we've, well, it's given us freedom to work here without our kids, which is kind of nice. <laughs> so, pornography is another one that also applies, what about others? And in these stages, we're preparing for what we also don't want to ever have to happen. I'd love for you to never look at pornography. I would love for you to never have trauma. I would love for you to never be abused. But the reality is that many will, and we want to prepare them to not freeze. Fight, flight is great. We don't want freeze. And so we want to be able to prepare them by teaching them some of these skills, which is really important. When it comes to pornography, we want to teach about where, where this stuff is coming from and the human trafficking and things like that. Oh, they're too young. No, they're not. When at this age they start connecting the little boys and little girls just like me, get stolen off the I-5 corridor right here from parking lots along this, they start seeing the world a little different. You're not there to scare them, and you have to be careful. Every kid's got a different sensitivity level, but helping them see that this is a world that we need to be smart, to be wise, to do things in twos, to be in groups, to be careful with that. How do I be a friend? What does that look like? This is, again, that stage where they're learning, and they're, they're relating. Who first to? Mom and dad. Who else? Siblings. And then it goes, it gets, the, the circle gets bigger and bigger. When we moved here to Oregon from Georgia, we realized like our kids, their whole world was that one little house in Georgia that we lived in. It's kind of neat and weird to think about. Their whole world was that house. We went to church, but they were so little, there was not much else that they did. 
and to see that they not only drove across country, which we've done tons of times since, but their world was expanding, and that's what we want. We want their world to expand. We want more control over it, probably, than, um, than not, but another really important part of this section is they are under authority. This is so critical that these young men and young women, I actually really call them boys and girls, that are rioting and throwing chairs through windows in Portland and Seattle and other places, they need spankings, first of all, but they need parenting. What's missing is, no, we don't do that. Basic stuff. That shows where we have failed culturally where we can go, hey, we can be really, do a really good job of this. Um, that they are under authority, all authority, how they treat a police officer, any, anyone, their teachers, even a teacher they disagree with, how do they treat authority. And then it starts at home, mom and dad. That's a biblical mandate. This um, stage is marked by experimentation and pushing of boundaries. Yet we haven't even gotten to adolescence yet. <laughs> so think about that. Those that have raised kids know very much what I'm talking about. Many of us, my, my mom and dad, we wouldn't even have these talks until after these ages. This is, this ain't Kansas no more. <laughs> it is time to really be intentional and prepare and protect, but prepare them for what they're going to face sometimes right around the corner. I've talked to young women who, in their own parents' house, um, around the corner from mom and dad, as in feet around the corner, they were assaulted by a you know, neighbor friend. This isn't they went to some far off place or it wasn't some scary dark, dark alley. It was right there in front of or around the corner from someone who thought they were, you can't be all eyes all there all the time protecting them. So at a young age, we want to prepare them to, be, to make decisions, to, to make judgment calls, even though in the end we would say, oh, they're not ready. Um, I agree, yet it's kind of funny to watch how they actually do step up, and they do, which is really cool. Now we get into age 11 to 17. So now this is when we actually might start maybe thinking of considering having the talk. <laughs> oh. And your kid goes, so mom and dad, what do you want, what do you want to know? And they're ready to tell us about sexting. We haven't heard of that before. Or... Mom, have you seen TikTok? And they're completely addicted to all sorts of crazy stuff. And we're clueless if we haven't been monitoring those things and trying to stay on top of what our kids are facing. When I wrote this book, too, I, I put micro-conversations through the whole thing. I love that phrase. And then I realized later, a lot of them aren't conversations. They're mini lectures. So careful to not expect a dialogue. A lot of parents I talked to, and this is why it kind of came to my mind, was the, they say, well, I try to engage, and they won't engage. Don't, don't let that stop you. You telling them a truth or teaching them something, and they have zero response doesn't mean it didn't land. So plant the seeds. Plant the seeds. Have those little mini lectures, micro conversations. If they talk, that's a bonus. Most of our kids, when something goes wrong, they're probably not going to talk to us. If yours is a kid that came to you and expressed that someone touched me or someone did this, you're an anomaly. That's not normal that the kid goes and tells mom or dad. So be, be thankful for that. We need to prepare them to go talk to someone. Um, they might find they have a better relationship with their youth pastor or their small group leader in the youth group or their coach. And you want to be able to curate and know who those people are. Uh, when our, one of our sons at one point fessed up to having seen pornography, um, he did it in his small group at church. And what does his small group leader do? He said, so are you going to tell them or am I? And it went up the chain. He went from there to the youth pastor and the youth pastor to us. And he had already told us. Um, but it was awesome. We were like, thank you. Those, thank you, thank you for loving our son enough to not just go, okay, this is private now. We're going to keep it, which is what I'm hearing from so many groups, youth groups. Now, this age right here, 11 to 17. This is the age you want to hang on for dear life. It shouldn't be. This is a young adult, in a sense. But then five minutes later, they're crying and they're two. So it's kind of this, maybe it's just bipolar. I don't know. We're all diagnosed as bipolar in this stage. 
Um, there's a really good book that talks about this stage of being the age of opportunity. Travis Ted, is it Ted, Ted Tripp maybe? Yeah. Such a great concept. This should be the time where you're building a relationship with them and helping them expand their tools and their experiences and their, their set of skills and what they can do. This is a time of identity, but it's not just the sexual part. Who am I? How do I dress? How do I present myself? How tough am I? How sweet am I? How strong am I? How you name it. These are different struggles that our, our teens are struggling with and trying to figure out. That they are fearfully and wonderfully made. To understand the Bible and what it says, and then how that applies to God did not make a mistake and make, put you in the wrong body. At all. So what are you going to do with that? Very different message than what, he's, what he or she's been given elsewhere. That as a body, your body is a temple as a believer. Every sin you commit is outside your body. And what I just said, you're not a mistake. You're not trapped in the wrong body, but you have a unique personality. This is how God made you. What are you going to do with that? And I feel like, especially the last two years, there's so many young people who have no clue how to take the next step. Because stuff has been stolen from them, ripped from them, taken from them. I see more, I believe the pandemic is starting now. And it's mental health. We're shrink, some bias there. But look at the data, it's terrifying. The suicides, the amount of AAs that never should have shut down because it was a choice between I'm going to die of COVID or I'm going to die of my addiction. And they die, died of their addiction. Like this is what's happened. We know that. How are we going to fix that? Well, it starts a lot with our home, but also then prepping our kids to maybe sometimes be the person someone else leans on, especially in this stage of life, which is really difficult. And we're, again, continuing to develop that understanding of sexual reproduction. What does it mean? When we talk about sex, it's all fun and games in a lot of the way it's sold and talked about. Every bit of it, it's all fun. It's like, no, sex is meant to make a baby. Every time, by the way. Every time we have intercourse, it's meant to... Now, thank goodness it doesn't. We have a lot of babies. <laughs> but the design is... So then it blows my mind how many people are scratching their head going, I don't know how we got pregnant. <laughs> oh my gosh. So we need to be able to talk about this in a way that the number one thing that comes out of this is a baby design. But other benefits is it's supposed to be a fun time. It's supposed to be a good thing. It's supposed to be a beautiful thing. And it has boundaries. It has a context. There's a place for this. Outside of that, it's actually, I brace my heart to think of how many, wonder how many kids they have or wonder what is happening. What scares me even more, guys and girls, this is not an equal opportunity employer here. What is the most feared STD? Yeah, AIDS is the first one that comes up. It's number nine on the list. There are eight other ones that are worse. We just like that one because it's hip and popular. Just kidding. Babies. <laughs> the number one is babies. We treat them like they're just some accident. Oops, I have a scrape, scratch, or an itch. But what's scary is some of those top ones, chlamydia and things like that, have zero symptoms. And when you finally find out and you're trying to have kids when you're married, if you have it more than once, and again, this is women, your potential, your potential for being able to have a baby goes into like the 20%. And a radical hysterectomy is next. This is not fair. So then I would say, guys, this is on men to step up and be the man and actually never, ever, ever, ever put a woman in that kind of position. It's on them. And biblically, that's actually exactly the design of marriage. That the ownership of this is on the men. And what actually is the reality? The man pushes and pushes and pushes. And who's having to constantly say no and say no and say no? It's horrifying. So how we teach this, what kind of man are you going to be? Is really, really critical. How do you refrain from sexual immorality? What does that look like? Temptation, hey, that's normal. Desire, yeah, it's, that's there. No matter what age you are. 
How do you manage social media? And there's a really easy way to manage social media, by the way. It's called not having it. Um, I used to, at Corbin, I would always create a Facebook group with our freshmen coming in. It's been actually really cool, the amount of freshmen coming in who don't have Facebook, mainly because mom and dad are on there. But um, it's changing. But what's scary is they're moving to probably worse places with Snapchat and TikTok, basically some of the most popular. And what's happening, we're losing our kids. Actually, some of you are lost, too. Your relationship with your phone is a little more intimate than your spouse. So just saying, we need to be careful, and we're not always the best example of that. So managing social media, what you do or don't do, what you do and don't post, some of you need to stop commenting on other people's stuff because you're just stirring up fire and stop it. <laughs> um, go play with the kids or something. Go do something di different. But we are becoming the example, and we need to talk through this with them. Because at some point, you're going to have to probably let them have something. When is that? Well, here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a lot of homeschool families who it's boundary, boundary, boundary. They're 18. All right, leave the house. And now it's everything is available. I don't have mom and dad now, so I can get a phone. I never had a phone before. Now I can get social media. I never had it before. Now I get... And they're going crashing and burning because everything is fair game. We need to be careful how we navigate this to help them make decisions within our purview so that when we then take away those, they're actually making wise decisions. So how you manage that is really difficult. Who are their idols and who influences them? Really, really important. Um, a lot of it, whether it's a movie star or whether it's a TikTok performer or a YouTuber, um, these, these people are important. What do they represent? What are they teaching? Dating, courting, further defined and boundaries at this point. What does that look like? The session I did before, we talked through kind of a, a design of that. And again, we have pornography. This doesn't change. This is something to steward and to understand the effects. And this stage is marked by experimentation and identity. Erickson's stages of development uh, from psycho babble stuff. This is the stage of identity formation. It's what it is. It's neat to see that way back when was still identified as that, and we're still kind of in that same space. Although we we create adolescence. And that goes till, what, 17, 18, 19, maybe? Or does it go to 30? <laughs> like, that's even changed. Where if you think of a few generations ago, how many were married at 14 and running the household? And it was normal. It wasn't like an overburdened thing. So we've changed a lot, and we need to adapt to those changes. So there's some expectations, too. Of you probably can expect more out of your... 12, 13 year old, and you realize chores, that kind of stuff. It starts at home. How are you treating others? This is again, how, how did they live this out? What does the Bible say, not mom and dad and social media? So, getting them back to, to the Bible, what, that, what it says. Deepening their identity. Are you kind, respectful, respectful? What is your work ethic? Is being played out. How do you love and talk to and be, have relationships with men and women who are LGBTQIA+, something we never even conceived of when we were kids? How do you love? How do you, and love is not endorsed. Love has not become an ally. Love has not um, put a, a flag in front of your house. Love is not all these things that it's become. Love is saying, I love you so much. I'm calling you to a higher, basically, level that here's what scripture says and your life will be way better here, which is really important. Beware of decisions that cannot be unmade. Supposedly our prefrontal cortex isn't developed till what age? 25. How many knuckle-headed stuff have we done in high school and college? It's like, that's scary. <laughs> Where you go to school matters. The kind of parties you do or don't go to matter kind of relationships you make matter. And there are some decisions you can make that you can't unmake. And so being able to be really intentional at curating your life, being careful with that, and you're helping them do that. Maintain an integrity of your convictions and what God um, is saying. We need to know God's word. This is really, really critical. 
Now today, from this, I spent less time on scripture. I did more of that earlier in the two sessions today because today was more of these topics. What do we say? What do we talk about? Um, this is what we're seeing more of. This is the norm. My wife and I were at a restaurant not too long ago, and we looked over, and there was, I think it was six or eight college students, and they had a stack of iPhones on the end of the table. It was awesome. And there was one girl who was orchestrating this, so it shows you can, you can influence your friends. When they went to the bathroom, she passed out all the phones, because one of them makes a noise, and they all look at them. And um, they all check their phones, and then when the last person came back from the bathroom, that she gave them back, piled them up on the end. It's like, we need friends like that. That's a leader, by the way, and they're leading in the right direction. That we, too many of us are not present. And they've even shown research that your phone, if it's just sitting out in front of you, you're showing you're not present. It's more important than you are. Put it away. You know, you could also do what my wife does and just lose it all the time. But <laughs> put it away. <laughs> um, what do we do with this? So we can kind of give you three words and then kind of some lists to kind of finish this here. Um, put this together a number of years ago thinking about these, the, I guess, plan that I would want for you, for your kids. The first is a vision. We, if, we don't, if we don't have a where we want to go, it's kind of hard to make decisions today. We just kind of wink it. We're kind of just going halfway. And I want to focus in on a vision for growth and maturity. So what are those things that need to be given to our sons and daughters to help them navigate? They will make their decisions, but I want to plant these it's a biblical picture of masculinity and femininity. What are their spousal standards, sexual boundaries? And you notice this is on one narrow path. There's lots of other ones. So I'm not talking about how you're going to manage money or all that other stuff. This is really critical. It's the area I spend most of my time in. What does it look like to be a man? What does it look like to be a woman, to be a husband, to be a wife? What do you expect? What are your absolutes and what you would not do? And then... Where do we get this from? And this is where you and I come in as moms and dads. We develop a code at home. What does that family code in our home come look like? We need to have rites of passage, significant tasks, logical consequences, and grace deposits. Our home needs to be a place where we actually help celebrate the milestones that our kids are going through. We're one of the few countries that doesn't have some really serious you are now no longer a, a boy, you're a man. You're now no longer a girl, you're a woman. I remember being in seminary, walking down the hall of the girls' dorm. I was an electrician there, and you're supposed to yell what? Man in the hall. And I was like, boy in the hall! I couldn't even say the word man, because I was like, oh, am I? I don't know. I'm in the girls' dorm, is this scary. Um, there needs to be logical consequences. Some of you are too soft. Toughen up. There needs to be some natural consequences, call the cops maybe, but maybe preferably you handle some things first, not just let things happen. There needs to be things that they do. There needs to be actually grace. Our pastor mentioned recently how we've done a really good job of moving more towards grace. We've also gotten away from obedience. And years and years and years ago when he started, it was all about obedience and not a lot of grace. It's a pendulum. We need to be careful with that. I don't know why I put this in here, but I thought it was really cool. <laughs> See, my you know, son hates us. We won't let him play football, but we like his brain. <laughs> so he decided to do karate now, and he's going to say so play in college. We'll see. <laughs> and then this third one, a cause. What does this look like? Finding a cause to fight for. How are, are you going to impact, or are, going to, are or are going to impact others for, for the better? It's really cool to look at a young person who knows they want to be a doctor or want to be this or want to be that. That's such a cool, it's so also cool to see how many don't become that. Because um, God has a different plan. My goal was to be a missionary and go back to South America and work in music. And you have to have talent. So I didn't go that direction. I tried to go that direction. Um, and I had passion. And I see how God used that to turn corners and take me to the next step, the next step. You need to help your child find that. And it may not be you who's doing a lot of that navigating. It may be actually other people you're curating. You're bringing into the fold, if you will. And you want to be the one that helps do that, not kind of just whatever happens or whatever group they end up at. Um, this also goes for us. Why are you doing what you're doing? 
Some of you have jobs you hate. Some of you have jobs you hate, but you love the job because it provides the money to do the stuff you love, and you have a good balance there. Some of you just hate your job and your life and everything else. That's a problem. Like, you created it. I see couples. It's like, we hate each other. It's like, great, you created this marriage. Blame who? You. Okay, how are we going to fix this? We need to change our, our tactics and learn that I can choose to love you or I can choose not to. That scare me. It scares me. I have that free will. I choose to love you or I choose not to. This passage really hit me years ago. I just keep coming back to the what is our call? And then we wanted to raise our sons and daughters to do. Teach the older men to be temperate. Worthy of respect, self-control. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. Then they can train the young women to love their husbands and children and to be self-controlled and pure. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled, live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. I think I sense a theme in that. That I need to actually be in control of myself, not others do and I just react or I just am. Own, have, take responsibility. Become the young man, the young woman that you choose to be. And that's, again, when you get that vision and you have reasons to, it actually gets a lot easier to make decisions and to become the man or woman that God calls you to do. And I just threw that in there because it's a cool picture. <laughs> now, I did the session earlier, but this is a, I created this seminar, Love, Sex, Dating, and Marriage, and it goes through these um, four areas. And it's for this purpose. It's about seven hours long, but it's looking at dating and then looking at questions to ask and things we talked about earlier. But then a picture of, so let me paint a picture of what marriage could be like. And when I get that locked in, I actually look at my decisions today and realize I'm settling for playing with Play-Doh versus actually having something amazing. If I actually wait, I need to have a reason to. And a lot of times what we do is try to scare kids with pictures of STDs in health class or you might get pregnant, but when you know everything and you're immune to any consequences, adolescence, <laughs> then it doesn't land. But when you develop a vision for yourself, it's funny how my decisions today, I own them. And I'm actually a little more protective of that. And this last one, the number one area that we can predict a future marriage's outcome, which is scary, John Gottman says with a 94% accuracy, is how you handle conflict. And they're learning it from us first, by the way. So we're the first examples of that. And so helping teach them how to engage in um, debate, engage in conflicts, and disagree, but also be respectful and be is a critical skill to help them grow up into the men and women that they we want them to be. So the statement again that I'll keep saying, either I do or someone else does. Which is actually scary to think about. Or the weight's on us. Are you gonna make mistakes? Yeah. We all are. Actually, if we get that out of the way, we can realize that I can choose to make the mistakes and give my kids probably the best gift I can give them. Say I'm sorry and ask, ask for forgiveness and be teachable. We don't want to be some parent that seems to have it all together and the kid looks at us and goes, well, I can't be like them, so forget everything, them and their God. They show fallibility. We're much more real for them to actually listen to and watch because they are watching that's my son, Blaze. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning in to the Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert podcast. It has been an honor to serve. If you are struggling, have questions, or in need, Dr. Gilbert offers a free consultation for new clients. Check us out at healinglives.com to book a call. If this has been helpful to you, please share it, leave a review, and help us get the word out so that we can see lives changed, marriages transformed, and more people come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. The Healing Life Center offers online courses, programs, books, intensives, and other services to help you live biblically and well. Discover more resources on YouTube and in Dr. Gilbert's Healing Marriage Facebook group, The Healing Marriage.